It's the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Ash, and this is episode 63, Digital Entrepreneurship During the 90s Tech Bubble. Let's go. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. It's getting towards the end of 2016. My gosh, I can't believe it. So much still to be done. I hope you've had such a productive year. And if you celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah or any of the holidays, I hope you find some time to relax and breathe and reflect on what you've accomplished this year and what you're excited to accomplish next year. My guest today is Jeff Berwick, AKA the Dollar Vigilante. Jeff has been a digital entrepreneur since the 90s, and I've got to say, I'm not very familiar with a lot of people who were digital entrepreneurs in the 90s. I was in high school at the time, just kind of noticing the tech bubble and all the excitement around the tech stocks, but I was just going to college and, and just didn't understand a lot that was going on. Well, Jeff was building a business, Stockhouse.com, which eventually had 250 employees in over 12 different countries and experienced the tech bubble firsthand. We go into his story about having a global business and then what the tech bubble did and how he navigated that very difficult entrepreneurial landscape. We also talk about Bitcoin and anarchy and how blockchains are helping us form digital communities unlike any other time in history. Make sure and stay tuned towards the end when Jeff gives his advice as someone who's been a digital entrepreneur for decades on how you can become a more effective entrepreneur more quickly. If you're already a digital entrepreneur and you have a business that you're building and it's becoming a little bit overwhelming, then I highly recommend you look into hiring a virtual assistant. If you're not familiar with what a virtual assistant is, it's someone who works on your team, but in a different country. You work online with them, not in an office, and oftentimes it's more convenient and much more affordable than hiring someone domestically. At the end of the day, we're just looking for people that have the skills and talents and passions like we do to help us build that freer future. If you're interested in virtual assistance, then please contact me. I've got a very deep network and I can definitely help you get started. You can send an email to apply at libertyentrepreneurs.com and I'll be glad to send you some free information to help you get up to speed on just what it means to hire and work with a virtual team. So let's get right into the show. Jeff brings a lot of energy and passion and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. So I'd like to welcome Jeff Berwick, the one and only. Welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Oh, my pleasure, Ash. I've been familiar with Jeff for quite some time now. He has uh, the Dollar Vigilante and Anarchast, and he is probably the voice online for anarchy these days. I'm really proud to have you on the show. Could you give us just a little bit of background of who you are and what your passions are? Huh. Uh, who am I? That's a good question. Uh, I grew up in Canada. I uh, never liked the government indoctrination camps. So they call them public schools. And um, basically did a deal with my mom when I was, uh, I guess around grade 10, I stopped going and she didn't even know. Uh, and uh, the principal called one day and he said, you know, your son's never here. And uh, she said, what? And she came and talked to me and I was like, yeah, it's stupid. <laughs> it's a waste of my time. <laughs> And she said, well, you gotta, you gotta go, you gotta get your high school diploma. And I was like, why? I'm never gonna use it. And I said, you know, they're just teaching me a bunch of garbage I couldn't care less about and half of it's wrong, like social studies and the teachers are idiots. And, uh, and uh, I did a deal with her in the school and I don't think you can probably do this anymore. Maybe you can, I don't know. But uh, where I would just go for the tests essentially and I'd read the textbook like the morning of the test, write down as much as I could on my arms and legs and memorize the rest. and basically aimed to get 50% in every single class, which I basically did, just to get my high school diploma, which no one's ever asked me for my entire life. Ever. Uh, no, ever. <laughs> and then I uh, 
Well, I lived in like uh, Edmonton, Canada, which is very, very cold. It's like minus 30 uh, there right now. <clears throat> and uh, I was like, why are we living here? <laughs> this is not even habitable. And the only place in Canada that uh, has decent weather is Vancouver or British Columbia. And it, it doesn't really even snow uh, some winters and it gets down to like just freezing sometimes and that's about it. So I just, uh, one day I was watching TV and it was like, a, I remember it was a Tuesday night and I said, ah, oh, that's it, I'm moving to Vancouver. <laughs> and, and my mom was like, what? And um, I just packed all my stuff in my car and I just took off. And I remember sleeping on the, on the highway, getting there. And I got there and I didn't even know where I was. There was no Google Maps or anything back in like 1991. For sure. <laughs> and um, I, I didn't even know where I was. Try to get an apartment. And I remember the guy was like, well, <clears throat> do you have a job? And I said, uh, uh, do I need one to get the apartment? He said, yeah. And I said, yeah, I work at a superstore. I don't know if they have those in the U.S., <laughs> but it's like a Safeway or something, like a grocery store. And he said, what's the number? And I said, oh, I don't know. I'll go get it for you. And I ran down to a local payphone, and I wrote down the number on the payphone. This is back when there was payphones, too. There was no cell phones. I, I gave him the number, and I said, yeah, call him in like five, ten minutes. Uh, my manager should be there. And I ran down to the pay phone, the phone rang. I went, yeah, Superstore. And they said, hey, does Jeff Berwick work there? Oh yeah, he's the best, yeah. <laughs> Employee of the month. <laughs> and that's how I got the apartment. And then I, I worked as a waiter and uh, uh, a bunch of other super odd jobs. I were actually ended up working at Superstore. I actually forgot about that. That's kind of funny, I didn't even think about that. So yeah, I ended up working there. I was like uh, loading shelves from like five to s eight in the morning or something before the store opened that was horrible and, and yeah uh, <laughs> a, a lot of people would say like th these are worthless jobs you know you're not going to learn anything in these jobs but compare that to what you were learning in high school oh yeah no you definitely learn more by working uh and that's the whole thing like the you know the kids nowadays and there's kids until they're 30 now uh they go through the they're just in school forever i don't know if you use tinder ash but wherever i go i, I don't mind just sort of seeing what the local people are like you know go, mm -hmm. get on tinder and every single person I, I put in the age you know i go from like 20 years old to 50 I, anything around there and um and i'll see like 40 year olds 45 year old women everyone's in school it's all school everyone's in school no one's working that's the whole idea that you go to school to learn so you can get a job it's like i don't understand that whatsoever it doesn't make any sense why don't you get a job to learn yeah. how to work yeah. and get a job <laughs> exactly right yeah it seems pretty backwards so w when did you become an entrepreneur i mean you were always skeptical it sounds like of authority and wanting to go out and become independent you know when did you learn about entrepreneurship well, I was thinking about that because I knew I was coming on your show and I don't really even know like how, I don't understand how it's that different from just life, like how an entrepreneur is that different from just a human being, right? Because mm -hmm. when I was younger, uh, you know, I, I think my first job was delivering newspapers in Edmonton, Canada, in minus 40 for half the year, in snowstorms, in like six feet of snow, and I'm not even exaggerating, uh, 10 years old, 12 years old. Uh, and to me, that was sort of entrepreneurial because back then, uh, this is when they used to have newspapers and they used to deliver them. I don't know if they do that anymore. You're selling really old these days, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, oh man, tell me about it. And uh, uh, I remember we used to have to go around and try to sign people up to get the newspaper, right? So to me, I was just, yeah, I'm building oh, my sure. business, right? I'm 10 years old and you know, I had like a huge paper route all over the whole city. I had half the city of my place, right? And uh, so to me that, you know, if you said, do you have a job? It's like, well, what's a job? I'm, just, I'm making some money, I'm doing deals, I'm, you know, getting stuff done, whatever. And then I remember I was a hockey referee after that, very Canadian, obviously, and I just uh, try to get in as on a, a ref as many games as I could to make a lot of money. So did I have a referee job or was I a hockey referee entrepreneur? I don't really know what the difference is. Uh, and then, uh, <clears throat> then I, I had a few other weird jobs. I actually worked for the city. Uh, my dad worked for the city his whole life. And uh, he got me a job as a sewer worker, and I was down in the sewers, uh, you know, just uh, working in the sewers. <laughs> that was not Thanks, fun. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> and, um, uh, and oh, and then I worked in the mailroom for the city, and they fired me. Oh, here's a funny story that you might like. So um, I, I'm like 18 or something, and I'm working in the mailroom, and I walk in on the second or third day. I went to the manager. I said, you know, you only need about 
three people working here. There's like 15 people working, right? I'm like, really? Like, look at your systems. This is horrible. And right. she got so mad at me and they fired me because go. they're all union employees, right? So right. she wants, you know, the, the most people possible working for her. It's all government, right? That's the exact opposite of real business, right? Jeff Berwick starting a mutiny within the uh, post office. <laughs> so Jeff, let's talk about Stockhouse. I know this was in the nineties. This is during the boom. Like what was that like? How did you get the idea for Stockhouse? And, and you, you know, just what was that experience like for you? Well, I was working at a bank in Canada and I, I started as a teller and I worked my way up very quickly to uh, doing loans. And then I started doing investment advice and I was only about 21 years old. And, uh, uh, so I really got into the investment side. I wanted to become a broker and I actually, uh, went and applied at the bank to be a broker. Um, and I'd already started Stockhouse. So for people who don't know, stockhouse.com is the largest financial website in Canada. It's similar to marketwatch.com of Canada. And, um, I, I was still working the bank when I started, it was very small when I started it and I went to apply at the brokerage. I said, yeah, I want to be a stock broker. I'm really interested in the stock market. And they said, well, what's your experience? I'm like, well, none really. And uh, they said, well, wh what do you offer? And I said, well, I have this website with like at least 20,000 people on it and they're all interested in stocks. So I'm pretty sure I'd have a pretty big client base right off the bat. And the guy was like 70, went, what's a website? And this is like yeah. 1993, right? right. And, um, and so I didn't get the job. And uh, then the, they wanted to offer me the bank manager position. I was still about, maybe at this point I was like 23 or something, uh, or maybe 24 sort of like the top people from the company, this is a big bank in Canada, one of the top five big banks, they all flew in because I was going to be the youngest person ever promoted to bank manager. And uh, they, they call me in, they said, hey, we're going to take you out for lunch today. We've got this amazing news. It's, it's going to be the best day of your life. I was like, really? Wow, let's go. Let's see what's happening. I show up and they said, we want to offer you the, the bank manager position. I said, well, how much does it pay? And they said, it's $40,000 a year to start. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to quit <laughs> because <laughs> I'd already started Stockus on the side and I could see the potential of it and it was already making some money. And I was like forty thousand dollars, and and I actually remember going back to the bank, and all the old ladies who worked at the bank were like, "How can you quit? You had a job for life." And I was like, "Why would I want a job for life?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they're like, "You get free dental." And I'm like, "How much does it cost to get your teeth cleaned?" They're like, fifty bucks. <laughs> who cares?" <laughs> but so, you can move up that corporate ladder, Jeff. Oh, man. It's, yeah. The funny part is I still knew or know all the people who worked at the bank with me, and many of them are all still in the bank, and, well, those who haven't had heart attacks and died or just died of being miserable. And the, even the people who are still there, every time they talk to me, like, I wish I did what you did. <laughs> and oh, I'm like, sure. Yeah, because they're just they're st stuck in this horrible job. It's like a government job. I actually worked for one year for the the Navy as a programmer. And even within that one year, I learned that, you know, there's a saying that Bob over there, he's going to die in that chair. You know, he's never going to leave here. <laughs> Bob's going to die in that chair. So yeah, banking isn't that far away from wow. uh, a government job these days. So I think you sold Stockhouse and then you, you started to create what well, the dollar vigilante after that, or, or what was, what was the timeline there? Yeah, well, I, I already started Stockhouse and it grew to, by 1999, 2000. We had 250 employees in eight countries around the world and it was valued at $240 million market cap. And we were going to go public on the NASDAQ. And this is around 2000. And uh, then the uh, tech bubble burst. So I had all these people, I had Lehman Brothers who aren't even around anymore and a number of others who were all calling me every day. They all wanted to take us public on the NASDAQ and like a billion dollar IPO. Mm -hmm. And uh, th then I, I was actually in Hong Kong when the tech bubble collapsed. I still remember the day uh, and when it just all crashed. And all of a sudden my phone just stopped ringing. I stopped getting emails from anybody who wanted to take us public. They just wouldn't even answer my calls anymore. And within a few months, it became very clear that the company was in big trouble because we had spent so much money expecting to do a billion dollar IPO. Uh, we had rented an office in New York for like $2 million a month or something. We we're right across from the New York Stock Exchange and we we're gonna do live video broadcasts. This is way before YouTube. Uh, and uh, and all of a sudden, they were just, everything was just gone. There was no money uh, being uh, raised for the company anymore. So we pretty much had to uh, roll back from 250 employees in eight countries to about 
12 employees in one country and just survive. And by the end of all that and laying everyone off and going through it all, I was just exhausted because from start to finish, it was about 1993 to about 2002. So nine years of literally working 18 hours a day for seven days a week. And um, I was just exhausted and I sold the company for not too much really, just barely anything. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. And um, <clears throat> and then I uh, tried to uh, travel the world for a while, figure out what's going on. I bought a sailboat. I tried to sail around the world. I sank it in El Salvador. And then I just backpacked uh, to about 100 different countries over about five years, just trying to figure out what was happening in the world and uh, and actually researching what happened with that tech bubble collapse because I didn't understand how that could happen. Mm. And then the first first book I read after my company uh, collapsed was The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin. Uh -oh. And I was like, why didn't anyone tell me about this stuff? And so during this whole time while I was traveling and I'm like, man, everything they say on the media is just wrong. Like all, they say all these places are dangerous. They're not dangerous at all. They say the U.S. is land of the free. It's like the least free country in the world. I was like, I got to start telling people about all this stuff I've learned. And so it was around 2009 that I, I thought, okay, it's time for me to get back to work and do something. And so I started the dollar vigilante just sort of telling people how the entire financial economic monetary system works and even everything from politics to uh, uh, how the media <laughs> how everything's basically not what you think it is yeah, it's pretty much everything is fake news. You know, the, 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 after Donald Trump was elected, all the Democrats started crying, fake news, fake news created this whole monstrosity. And no, the, the mainstream media has been fake news since since the mainstream media was established. I mean, <laughs> I saw on Facebook, I can't remember whose post it was today, but said uh, even back in the 1960s and 70s, you know, the CIA was uh, creating student run newspapers and, and, and buying journalists to try to push different narratives just to see how they could socially engineer society. I mean, if we want to get rid of fake news, we got to get rid of the government. Tell us just a little bit more about the dollar vigilante. You've got a very vibrant and alive and energetic community. Is that whenever that started? Was it with the dollar vigilante? Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I started the Dar Vigilante in 2010, and the main goal was just to get people financial information and and tell people how everything works. And and uh, the whole it's called the Dar Vigilante because it's talking about eventually the dollar is going to collapse and all fiat currencies are going to collapse. And uh, and so that's how it started. So I started writing like that, and we called ourselves a narco capitalist newsletter. So the first sort of people uh, calling ourselves those sort of words, even back six years ago, the word anarchist or anarcho-capitalist wasn't really that well understood. It's still quite misunderstood, but mm -hmm. even the word libertarian, most people didn't even know what that meant. And now it's it's way more mainstream, obviously. So uh, we were re really at the beginning of that. And um, uh, so I started it up and sorry, my chihuahua's here. Um, and, um, uh, you know, we're just putting out this information and, and then I just... Uh, it, it's really started to grow. Uh, we're putting out good information. I, I got into Bitcoin at three dollars in 2011, which made a lot of our subscribers millionaires and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, we've just been on the leading cusp of a lot of these things. And uh, at the same time, though, I, I saw that there was a real need for more information about uh, anarchism, about voluntarism, about narco-capitalism. So I started another podcast called Anarchast, which has really grown. And uh, we also have our, our conference every year called Anarchapoca, which is now the world's largest uh, anarcho-capitalist conference uh, in the world uh, and um, going very well. And so I, I do all those which things. I, which I highly recommend, by the way. I went last year. I think this is going to be the third year in February 2017, which is going to be the biggest, from what I've heard from talking to you, Jeff, it's going to be the biggest yet. It was such a blast last year. It's down in Acapulco, Mexico. Beautiful scenery, beautiful water, and just awesome people. This is the biggest gathering of peaceful and philosophical anarchists that you're going to find in the world. So if you consider yourself an anarchist or, or even just a peaceful person, I know that the term anarchist has a lot of labels to it. We're not the people wearing the mask and throwing the Molotov cocktails. I mean, nobody in my audience thinks that, but it's just such a great opportunity to see people who believe and see the world like we do as a, a peaceful free market come together and see how we can help each other. You know, you mentioned Bitcoin. Jeff, and I know you were not only were you a very early digital entrepreneur, but you were also an early Bitcoin adopter as well. What was it about Bitcoin that really got your attention? Well, I remember the first time I heard about it, I was at Doug Casey's uh, La Stancia de Cafajate in Argentina in 2011. And a guy took me aside. He said uh, he heard about Bitcoin. And I said, no, what is it? 
And he told me and I went, well, that sounds really interesting. And within a few hours of talking, I was like, this is going to change the world. <laughs> and uh, and then I met actually Trace Mayer down there as well. And he mm -hmm. was like, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to get you your first Bitcoin. And this is again, I think 2011. And uh, he, he said, okay, open a Bitcoin wallet. And I think I, I did it on blockchain, I think. Or, uh, yeah, I think it was blockchain.info back then. Uh, and, or, or something like it. And, or maybe it was a real wallet or whatever. And, um, and uh, then he sent me some Bitcoin. He sent me like, uh, it was like $10 worth at the time, but I guess that'd be like $10,000 worth now or yeah, something I close to it, right? Like two, bit, three Bitcoins or something back then. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so it'd be yeah, a few thousand dollars for the Bitcoin. And uh, he and I said, okay, now what do I do with it? And he said, oh, there's a few sites that sell stuff for Bitcoin. So we went to the. He said, go to this site, and they sold books. And I bought a book for you know the two thousand dollars. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, I was like, this changes everything. And so I just started talking about it and uh, got on you know my newsletter. And, but the thing about it was, it was you know, it does change everything. Uh, the whole, the main problem with the monetary system today is it's all fake. It's <laughs> just like everything else. It's all run by central banks, which is a tenet of communism. It has absolutely nothing to do with free markets or capitalism. Nothing. Uh, yeah, absolutely nothing. And um, you know, it's all controlled by these people, and they print up as much money as they want, which destroy economies. That's why most of the problems in the world today, uh, even Ron Paul said, it's no coincidence that the 20th century was a century of total war, was a century of central banking, because you can't even have these giant wars without uh, the ability to print up money. So I just saw the, all that almost immediately and thought, man, this can actually get rid of central banks, which would actually pretty much get rid of governments, which would pretty much end all wars, and it's super easy to use. Uh, it's super convenient. It's almost free to use. Uh, it's <laughs> you can send money from one side of the world to the other in a few seconds uh, for basically no cost. And if you're smart about it, no one will even even really know who you are. Uh, so you know, I just saw that pretty quickly and and just jumped on the bandwagon as fast as possible. Unfortunately, I didn't buy a lot, uh, but I, I talked about it a lot and got involved in a few things, uh, including starting the world's first uh, Bitcoin ATM back in 2013 which we were hoping to bring into Cyprus after the bank bail-ins mm. uh, but that company had some problems and we um, sort of didn't uh, we had a falling out with the uh, the people I was working with so that didn't work out but um, yeah I just saw from the very beginning just how important it is and now there's so many things going on in the cryptocurrency uh, space it's and the blockchain space yeah it's 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 absolutely unbelievable it's just starting really yeah, it is just starting, you know, whenever I go to, to non Bitcoin conferences or non libertarian conferences, like I just attended FinCon, uh, which is a personal finance conference and spoke on Bitcoin there, but I wasn't surrounded with my tribe, right? Jeff, like you and trace and, and Eric and Roger and these guys, like we're, we're inundated all day, every day with cryptocurrency and Bitcoin type of information. Sometimes I forget that we're still a very small minority, but we're building so much like once, once digital currency cryptocurrencies start taking hold in different economies like you said cyprus or maybe greece or argentina or colombia or venezuela or panama you know there's going to be just a massive influx of interest coming into this space i think we may not be in the very very early days of bitcoin anymore but we're still in the early days because you go out on the street and ask 10 people what bitcoin is most likely all 10 of them are going to tell you uh i think you buy drugs with it <laughs> yeah, uh, to me, you know, I was around for the when the internet first started. So I remember I was on computers in 1982. That's why I wasn't going to school. I was so into computers. And uh, by around 1993, when I, f I f remember the first person told me about the internet too, sort of like my JFK assassination moments is when I heard about the internet and heard about Bitcoin. And uh, and with the internet, I said the same thing. I said this changes everything. And um, I remember it was it was it was almost exactly the same as Bitcoin has been since about 2011. Is uh, you know most first of all when I started my uh, internet company, I'd go around to uh, uh, companies and try to sell them websites. Uh, to, you know that was one way we made some money. So I'd walk into like we were trying to sell them to public companies because we had a financial website. We're going to upsell them the advertising on our site and all that sort of stuff. So I'd meet with the CEO of these companies and I'd say, hey, you guys need a website. And the guy would go, what's a website? And I'd say, it's on the Internet. And they'd say, what's the Internet? So that's like right. 1993. So to me, Bitcoin was around that level, around 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now sort of like 1994, 1995 in terms of the Internet. Uh, so uh, a number 
of people have now heard about it. Uh, most people still have no idea how it's going to change their lives. And I still remember even in 19, well, who was it? Paul Krugman, that amazing economist who works for the New York Times, <laughs> a Nobel Prize winning economist. I think it was like 1998, he said that uh, within 10 years, we'll realize that the internet had become no more important than the fax machine. Uh, right. and, and so that was how people were even talking in 1998. Uh, so, and that was right before the internet's tech stocks just went, you know, absolutely ballistic. They're up like thousands of percent. And this is supposedly one of the smartest economic guys, you know, PhD guys in the world. I mean, he's, he's every president's right hand man and who they come to to try to help set economic policy it's just such a joke these guys these are the guys that stay in high school and stay in college and, until they're 30 years old jeff don't do anything <laughs> with their life but they've got some you know credentials and letters after their name so they get respected for knowing absolutely nothing um oh yeah don't get me started on krugman <laughs> yeah, what a clown i think you know we can leave uh we can leave krugman in in the good hands of tom woods <laughs> so let's talk about anarchapoco jeff how did you get the idea for this i mean you've been an entrepreneur for a very long time you know one of the earliest digital entrepreneurs that i've ever met and and talked to i don't know anyone else who was building uh digital websites and digital businesses back in 1993 how did you come up with the idea of anarchapoco and what's the purpose of it well, like I said, I started uh, my podcast, Anarchast, in, I think, 2011, and uh, the main goal was to get information out about the philosophy of anarchy, and as you pointed out earlier, it's a beautiful philosophy. It's a philosophy that no one has the right to rule you, uh, and that you are your own ruler, and uh, it's a beautiful philosophy, but that's why they try to uh, always put it in the media like it's some sort of horrible thing uh, because all the government and the media uh, if if people <laughs> got into anarchy there wouldn't be any government and the mainstream media be gone so right. uh, so I started that up and that was kind of interesting because again most people didn't know anything about anarchy at all back then it's changed so fast over the last five years and now it's like very, it's quite well known and you, you start, you're starting to see people on TV like I think it was uh, that comedian recently I forget uh, his oh, name yeah. yeah I know who you're talking about it, it was the guy Home from improvement. Tim, yeah Tim the Toolman Taylor who was that um, yeah whoever that he was guy. that guy he, he was just on TV said he's an anarchist Woody Harrelson says he's an anarchist there was a Fox uh, business guy who says he's a narco capitalist but I don't think he is but I think he just thinks it's cool uh, and then you have all the other ones like Glenn Beck and all these other hacks like uh, Bill Maher, and they all say they're libertarians because it's so cool. Like everyone's like so into libertarianism now that they say they're libertarians. They're obviously not libertarians, but libertarianism is so like it's just it's absolutely just taken off in the last five to ten years. Uh, and and right behind libertarianism is anarchy. Uh, most right. people who get into libertarianism uh, quite quickly figure out, oh yeah, why do we need any government whatsoever? Uh, it just makes no sense. And uh, so I started that up and it went kind of slow for the first couple of years, but in the last couple of years, it started to take off our podcast. And so it was around 2014, maybe, yeah, around 2014. And I've been going to a lot of freedom conferences in the US, uh, like Freedom Fest and Pork Fest, and there used to be one called Libertopia. Yeah. And I'd always complain when I was there. I'd say, why do they have these freedom conferences in one of the least free countries in the world? You can't do mm. anything. There's cops on every corner. There's You can't go into the bars. The bars close at one, and then you get arrested and all this sort of stuff. And... Um, and uh, someone on Facebook or somewhere said, hey, why don't you do a freedom conference down in, in Acapulco, Mexico, where you spend a lot of time, because uh, you're always talking about how much freer it is down there. And I, I thought, I don't know if anybody would be interested. Uh, and so we, you know, this is just straight entrepreneurship 101. If you think there might be a market, you just do it and see if there is. And so that's what we did. We just said, okay, we're having a conference next February. It's an Acapulco. It's a, it's the first anarcho-capitalist conference. Uh, in the world, and uh, I was really not sure if anyone would show up. Uh, I had no idea, and I thought maybe 50 to like 90, maybe 100, uh, like really hopefully thinking 100, and it turned out to be about 250. And uh, the people walked away from it. Like, w w I had no plans to do it for another year. I just thought we'd just do it once and see what happened. And um, at the, at the closing, we finished off the conference and everyone said, you have to do this next year. And I had mm -hmm. no plans to do it. And I said, okay, we'll do it next year. Because everyone's like, we're all coming back. This is the, be the most amazing thing we've ever been to, they said. And um, so then we did it again this year. So the first one was 2015. So we did it in February 2016. And we had about 500 people. So doubled again. 
and uh, we've actually filled up the whole conference room, the whole hotel there, as you know. And um, and then we're uh, so th that's when I really kind of recognize this thing really has you know life of its own now, and it's really something that people really want. And so we really planned for this upcoming one in February 25th to 28th of this year of 2017. And we booked the, like, the, the best conference uh, 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 place in all of Acapulco. It's, it's pretty much brand new, five-star hotel and conference uh, center. And actually, we got approached by the guy who, uh, uh, like the right-hand man of the guy who owns the hotel is a Mexican billionaire. And we were going to do it in the same hotel as last year, but we were like, oh, I don't know if we have enough space because I think there's going to be a lot more people next year. And we get a call from them, and they're like, we want your conference at our hotel. And we went and met them for lunch, and, and we said, why? And they said, well, the owner's an anarcho-capitalist. He's, he's a billionaire oh, wow. Mexican guy, and wow. he loves your conference. And I was like, oh, our deal. And uh, he gave us amazing uh, rates and everything. Yeah, that's that's really amazing. And you've got some, some of the people that I've been paying attention to for years now coming to speak. I mean, you've got Larkin Rose, uh, Jeffrey Berwick. I mean, excuse me, Jeffrey Tucker. <laughs> you, I mean, Jeff Burke is there, too. Uh, <laughs> you know, Adam Kokesh, I mean, Roger Veer, Dana Martin. I mean, this is it, it's just getting better and better, Jeff. I really you, we have such a need to have people with this perspective and this ideology to get together so that we can surround ourselves with people who speak our same language. You know, whenever I'm walking down the street, it doesn't matter what city or what country I'm in. For the most part, nobody sees the world like I do. So it's it's like a, it's a vacation getaway, especially for my, my brain to be able to come down to your conference in Arcapulco and talk to people that I don't have to explain to them who's going to build the roads, right? <laughs> We're already past that point. I don't have to go on why we need money competition. Why isn't the dollar just, why shouldn't that be the world's currency? Uh, I'm really interested in going, if any of my audience would like to get a discount on their ticket to the conference, uh, you can use the coupon code Liberty E for 10% off. I highly recommend you come. Uh, I'm definitely going to be there. Please come and say hey to me. You know, before we get going here, Jeff, I got just a couple more things I'd like to cover. Sure. Steam, steamit.com. This is something that you and I are, are both members of this community, you more so than I am, but I've really appreciated uh, what Steam has done by using blockchain in a community sense to incentivize content sharing. You know, I interviewed Ned Scott uh, a couple months ago, but how did you find Steam and what was it about Steam that really got your attention? Uh, I think it was around July of this year, and it was just someone on Facebook who I knew quite well. And I'd had a few people a few months before that tell me about it. And But I get so many things crossing my desk every day or my desktop on my computer that you know you can't even look at like 90% of them. But I had heard it enough that I thought, okay, I'm going to go check it out. And uh, as you know, I went there and I posted, uh, hey, I'm here on the site now, and I made $15,000 in it one was insane. day. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I got to look into this. What is this? And uh, within a few days or at least a few weeks, of it's, it's a little hard to understand how it all works, but it's really ingeniously designed. Uh, within a few days or weeks, I kind of had my head wrapped around it. I was like, this is really interesting. This could change a lot of things. And, and what's interesting to me is that even in just the last few months, I've started to really realize why it's so important. And it's because of things like this fake news thing they're doing now. Uh, I have I know many people who are already getting blocked on YouTube and Facebook just for posting things that you know you're not supposed to talk about about the government uh, all real things but they call it fake because it's 1984 uh, mm -hmm. but uh, you know that that's why Steam is so important so for people out there who don't know Steam and Steam it is essentially a, a social media site that's all based on the blockchain so you can't really censor anything uh, and so in this day and age where it looks like censorship is coming in massively right now. Uh, this is a really important and valuable uh, use for blockchain technology, and the way they've set it up is just so ingenious. Um, I don't understand why more people aren't using it, but it's still very, very early. It really launched uh, just about six months ago, so it's actually mm -hmm. still in beta. Uh, but um, I think it has just you know huge potential. It might not work out as as many things happen in uh, you know when you start up an uh, entrepreneurial enterprise. Sometimes they just don't work out. And sometimes they fail. But uh, I think even if it does fail for whatever reason, I think there'll be other ones right behind it, and this idea isn't going to go away. Yeah, I agree with you because now we can submit our content to our community 
put it in the blockchain, which all of us are going to run a blockchain node to, because we want to secure our own communities. And so people can't just come and censor us because just like Bitcoin, to hack Bitcoin, you have to hack thousands and thousands of nodes or computers around the world to gain control. Now with a blockchain-based community, we're basically securing our content and our communications with each other. Whatever we want to secure, we insert it in our blockchain and boom, it's got that very, very large amount of security and perseverance that comes along with it. I, I'm a huge fan. You know, I saw Jeff that they just changed their economic model, which is one of the, you know, one of the criticisms I had whenever I had Ned on the show was, you know, it's hard to keep this hundred percent per year type of hyperinflation. Uh, were you any part of that? Did, you know, did they come and ask you what you would change in the economic model or, or how did that come about? No, actually, I had no idea about it. I did hear about it before they went public with it, but uh, no, they didn't ask me about that at all. That was probably, I'll bet it was Dan Larimer. Uh, Dan is uh, one of the smartest guys I've ever had the chance to talk to. Uh, he understands Austrian economics on a massive level, and he also understands cryptocurrencies. Uh, more than 99.9999% of people out there, uh, and he combines the two. So I think they recognized there was some issues with the way the model was set up, and you never you, you could just imagine trying to design this thing. That's why I think Dan's a, a genius trying to design this whole thing before he even put it out there, uh, mm -hmm. and then you know he he did it so well that it was it was working fairly well, but obviously it needed to be tinkered with quite a bit uh, but you know even just the concept of having sort of like the sort of the three currencies all bundled into one how they all play off each other and and why they're set up that way it's so that it, yeah it's, it's absolutely genius and he's a speaker at your conference as well right yeah that's right we're actually going to have a whole day the fourth day of an archipelago it's actually four days this year because we have so many speakers uh, is going to be a full uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain day that we're going to call, I think, CryptoPoco. And uh, it's just going to be all blockchain, cryptocurrency, uh, people like Arcade City, which is sort of the blockchain, uh, semi-blockchain yeah. based Uber. Uh, people like Steam, Dan Larimer. So people are doing things with the blockchain. Then we're, of course, going to have people like Trace Mayer, uh, Roger Veer, uh, uh, Tone Vase, uh, all kinds of uh, people talking about cryptocurrencies. Um, yeah, it's all going to be at an Archipelago. Yep. And if anyone wants to listen to what Arcade City is, you can check out my episode number 57, how Arcade City and blockchains are disrupting Uber. It's a really good interview with Christopher David. Uh, Jeff, I'm really interested to get your opinion on why you think more anarchists aren't entrepreneurs? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I really got into anarchy around 2003 or so. Uh, actually, Doug Casey was the first person. We, I was having dinner with him uh, in Canada uh, because uh, we had his content at the top of our financial site, Stockhouse, uh, because I just loved it so much. But I didn't really, I didn't know the whole philosophy of anarchy or anything. And he sat me down and we had dinner and he said, you know what you are, don't you? And I said, no, what am I? He said, you're a libertarian. And I said, what's that? I'd never even heard the word. And then we, he asked me a few more questions. He said, do you know what you are, don't you? I said, no. And he said, you're an anarchist. And I said, you know, as, 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 I'm ashamed to say it, but I said, what, you mean those people who throw bombs? I didn't know, right? right. And... Um, uh, what was the question? <laughs> I got a little off. Yeah, topic. yeah. Well, why do you why do you think that there aren't more entrepreneurial oh, right. anarchists? Uh, yeah, so I got into around two thousand three ish, and what I noticed back then was most of the anarchists were kind of this sort of angry, um, <laughs> uh, really detached from society. Uh, people who consider themselves more like rebels the, into punk rock music and all this kind of stuff. Uh, there was, a, of course, other ones, people like Doug Casey and other ones, and people like Murray Rothbard, of course, who started the, the whole term anarcho-capitalist and, and others like that. But a, a lot of the people who called themselves anarchists back then were kind of these... They, they weren't doing very well. They're always broke uh, and all that sort of stuff. But I've noticed a real change in the last five or 10 years. I think Bitcoin's a big part of it because when Bitcoin came out in 2009, uh, most people who were serious anarchists uh, were into it fairly early. Most people who uh, were into the, the sort of philosophy, things like Austrian economics, anarchy, uh, and technology uh, got onto Bitcoin way before most people. So I know a lot of people who, who made a lot of money uh, from Bitcoin itself. And I don't know. I don't know what it is that's changed. I think 
uh, I, I don't, I don't, I'm sure it's not just me who's helped it change, but I think things like uh, our show Anarchast shows all these people who are doing all these things. Uh, as you just pointed out, people like Christopher David, Arcade City, all these people, Dan Larimer, all, there's literally thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of people doing stuff now uh, who are all anarchists. And I think it's just been a shift. And I, I think it's just been in the last 10 years or so that uh, more of the anarchists are starting to become more what I call anarcho-capitalists, which is basically the same thing. But it's just got a bit more of a, uh, well, I'll give you one example. I, I've met so many people. I just met another one just a week ago. And she said, yeah, I just, I went to Narcopoco last year. I loved it. You know, I, I always thought money was bad. And I was like, because a lot mm. of them kind of came from this sort of, they're not necessarily socialists, uh, but it was more bent like that's that way. Uh, so a lot of them were kind of like, well, money's bad. Uh, so, uh, but as I've over the years, I've met so many and, and they're like, yeah, I used to be like that. I just thought money was bad, so I didn't even want to make any money. It just made me feel like a dirty part of the system. Uh, but then I realized that money is just a, a tool. It's a transfer of value between two people. And once I realized that, then I, I felt better about going out there and being entrepreneurial and making money. Right. It's like they're so against big business that they right. aren't or they aren't able to see the beauty that money is. You know, if if anyone out there hasn't read Atlas Shrugged, at least go and check out um, Fr Francisco Danconia's money speech. It may it may change your opinion on what money is. Jeff, let's get wrapped up here, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, you're definitely a powerhouse for peace and, and anarchy and entrepreneurship. What advice do you have for some of our fellow anarchists who haven't yet taken the step to become an entrepreneur? That's a good question. Uh, the things that I kind of see with people uh, when I... Uh, like I, I see a lot of people ask questions about how to be an entrepreneur, which I just find weird. I guess maybe it's just natural to me or something, but I just, I'm like, well, this is weird that you don't know this, but a, a lot of people just are not, um, they don't, they just have no idea how, how to do these sort of things. So they're scared of it. The advice I would give is there's really no school you go to. There probably is, but uh, there's you really don't need to go to school to become an entrepreneur. The way you become an entrepreneur is you just try to do something, and and what will happen? It doesn't even matter what it is. So you, you figure you just find something in the market that you can offer for a better price or a better quality than most other people can. That's it. That's all you, that an entrepreneur is, and. And a lot of people get scared, like, oh, but what if it fails? That's fine, because you're going to learn a ton when you fail. So if you say, oh, I, I, I think I can sell donuts cheaper than Krispy Kreme or something, and you start up a little donut shop and it fails, well, during that process, you're going to learn so much about business that it's actually going to be a, a net positive for you. So the next idea you have, you're going to be so much better at it. So like, don't even be uh, scared of failure. Failure is actually a uh, learning experience. Um, I, I don't... I don't know hardly any entrepreneurs ever that have not failed, that have not had a business that failed. Uh, and for me personally, I've had, well, numerous business problems, absolutely. I've had some disasters, uh, but every time it's made me into a much, much smarter uh, and more savvy and uh, better person uh, and entrepreneur because I've learned from my mistakes. And so... I, I guess that'd be the advice is, you know, just jump into something and don't even worry. If you fail, it's fine. Uh, and, you know, just start small. And another thing I, I know, because I just had a girl ask me the other day, she wants to start a ayahuasca retreat and she just got some money from some settlement and some thing in the U.S. And uh, she, she made 30000 and and she said, okay, I, I'm going to spend 30000 She She said, I think I need to borrow more money. Uh, I'm going to spend this 30000 and borrow a bunch of money to start this retreat. And I was like, why? And when she started to tell me, I was like, why? You don't need to spend any of that money. Nothing. Like every single business I've started, I've started with essentially zero capital. Uh, for example, the internet company. You just I had a website. I spent some money to get a website up. But after that, I just started selling websites to other people. I'm already making money. So uh, a lot of people think you, you need to spend a lot of capital to do a lot of things. For example, the Dollar Vigilante, that's now a very, one of the top financial newsletters in the world. It's very, very, um, doing very well right now. That 
took zero capital to start up. I just started up a website and then I just started writing on it every day. And then I started selling products that are related to it or a newsletter and things like that. So, uh, you know, uh, pe but because people haven't done it before, they're kind of scared of it, but there's nothing to be scared of. Just go out and try to do something. And like I said, if you fail, that's absolutely fine. It's actually probably good. It's probably good you fail a few times so you can read before you really try to do something quite a bit bigger uh, so that you learn. The one, the only, the dollar vigilante, Jeff Berwick. Thank you so much for coming on Liberty Entrepreneurs. I really appreciate what you're doing. And I will see you in February for the conference. Again, if anyone would like to purchase a ticket, head on over to anarchapulco.com and use the coupon code LIBERTYE for 10% off. And I will see you down there. Jeff, if my audience would like to get in touch with you, how can they do it? Yeah, it's been my pleasure, Ash. I should just point out your coupon code in case people didn't quite understand. It's the word Liberty with the letter E after it. Uh, and yeah, if they want to get in contact with me, just check out the Dollar Vigilante, dollarvigilante.com. And we're on YouTube with Dollar Vigilante. If you're interested in anarchy, check out Anarchast on YouTube. And if you're interested in anarchy and having a good time on the beach in February in, in uh, Acapulco, Mexico, check out anarchapoco.com. And I will definitely put all that in the show notes, Jeff. Thanks so much for coming on Liberty Entrepreneurs. My pleasure, Ash. And there you go, from basically dropping out of high school to building a digital business with 250 employees around the world, creating a successful podcast and conference, all while becoming an entrepreneur through experience and failure. Remember, if you'd like to go to the Anarchapoco Conference in February, then click on the link in the show notes and use the coupon code LIBERTYE for 10% off. I'll be there and a bunch of other anarchists and entrepreneurs will be there too. So until next time, you know what to do. Keep building freedom. <laughs>